And okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, that's self-explanatory. All right, good. Bipolar mood swings. So first, we'll just identify them real quick. What are the bipolar mood swings identified with classically? Swings occur, uh, the shortest they got to take is several weeks, sometimes two weeks, that's rare, uh, but usually months, sometimes even years. Uh, to swing from one state to another. No external triggers are needed. So we people typically try to explain when they get into a depression or out of a depression by giving it some reason because we all as human beings have a need to explain what happens to us. But typically there are, it's very difficult to identify triggers that cause it. Sometimes there are no triggers at all many times and the person still swings from one state to another. There is typically a family history that's positive, if not only for bipolar history, because many times people are trying to hide it or they were never diagnosed. Uh, by, by, there is a family history for depression, for alcoholism, for substance abuse, multiple marriages, that kind of stuff. Mood states have a global effect. What it means by that is they affect lots of other functions it's no it's not just so if somebody feels depressed it, it's affecting their somatic functions like they they either sleep a lot lose energy have diurnal variation of mood which means that they feel worse in the morning and a little bit better in the evening if they are in, the, in a depressed state their their thinking is slowing down they basically say quote this is quotes from patients that have treated doctor i feel like my brain has turned into cabbage. I can't think anymore. I don't know what happened to me, unquote, stuff like that. So it's, it's sort of global. There is cognitive slowing uh, when they are in that depressed state. And of course, the opposite happens in the up state. So somatic symptoms are common that have to do with, for example, in a depressed state, constipation, a lot of sleeping, no energy, uh, lots of aches and pains and so on. Mood may recover without treatment. So that's very common in people who had mild mood swings, bipolar mood swings before, typically they have recovered on their own from a depressed state without any treatment. And they got better, like one, mo one morning they wake up and say, whoop de doo I'm fine again. And it's all gone. And if the depression was mild, they just, they don't go for treatment and they just ignore it. They just move on with their lives. Medications are an essential part of treatment for bipolar mood swings. And as a single diagnosis may do well without lifelong therapy. So I'm talking about psychotherapy. So many people who get on the right medications like a mood stabilizer, such as lithium carbonate, they stabilize and they do well and they don't go for any psychotherapy and many of them don't need it and they do well without it. Uh, some upswings look like normal, effective achiever mood. So some people look at these uh, who are in the upswing and they look at them and say, gee, I would like to be like that. This is a wonderfully effective achieving individual with lots of energy. Wow, isn't that wonderful? And of course, what this is, is a very a sort of a mild hypomanic state that looks like normal. It doesn't look like an illness. All right, next slide, please. Now the non-bipolar mood swings, the swings occur, can occur within hours to days, sometimes even within the same day, somebody can swing from a depressed, sad state to, a, to, to the opposite of that, like feeling good and fine within hours within the same day. Uh, it usually is in response to some external trigger that happens, usually something socially, somebody said something about them or to them or they were ignored or not treated right and so on. Uh, family history is not consistent. So as opposed to the bipolar uh, mood swings, mood states have a limited effect, which means they do, they're not global. They don't affect the whole being of the individual affecting like appetite, eating, sleeping, 
energy level and so on. It's more limited to that mood state, uh, the emotional mood state. Somatic symptoms are not severe if they happen at all. And mood is responsive to therapy and social dynamics. So for example, if they had a misunderstanding with some friend and they felt ignored, and that friend calls them and says, I'm sorry, and they apologize, and we are friends again. So the mood changes again to be in a good mood. So that's what I mean by social dynamics and relationships. Psychotherapy and medications or both may help. Mostly psychotherapy is quite helpful. And whether it's CBD or other forms of supportive psychotherapy or, or insight-oriented therapy, but generally psychotherapy is quite helpful. And there is a need many times for lifelong therapy off and on and that is not uncommon. Some people don't need it, but some people wanna have someone they can turn to in times of what they call crises in their lives and having that someone, that therapist they can turn to is quite helpful to them. Next slide, please. Okay, so non-bipolar mood swings, I'm gonna go through this list, as you can see different diagnostic categories and see if we can identify something special about these when they have a mood swing, which is not bipolar in nature. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first group are people with substance-related uh, disorders. As you can see from the list, alcohol, uh, amphetamines, caffeine, cocaine, nicotine, opioids of all kinds, sedative, uh, anxiolytic, hypnotics, and so on. What we can say generally about that group is that the swings are a manifestation of the chemical effect of the specific drugs or the withdrawal from those drugs, meaning that the drugs, they are addicted to them and they're not available, it affects their moods. And the mood could be irritability. For example, someone who's addicted to alcohol, they cannot get their morning uh, drink, their hands shake, they get upset, they become irritable, uh, and they can even go to full-blown DTs as we know. But so it goes with other drugs. When they are on the drugs, it affects their mood. And when they're off the drugs and they are in a withdrawal state, again, it affects their mood. Mostly it's irritability, irritability and restlessness. So it's mostly a manifestation of the relationship chemical effect of the specific drugs they're on. And one of the best ways to, to, to actually diagnose that is that especially with a new patient that has a similar history with mood swings is to do what we have done when I worked in inpatient settings is a toxicology screen, urine and blood. So regardless of what the person says, that tells us right away what's, what's there if there is something that they took there on a regular basis. All right, next slide, please. All right, schizophrenia. What is typical when a person has suffering from schizophrenia and it has mood swings, and that happens in schizophrenia too, of course, the mood swings are related to the disease state itself. As we know, people with schizophrenia can be in a psychotic state or in a non-psychotic state. And when they are in a psychotic state, we treat them with antipsychotic medications and they can then improve and get into a non-psychotic state which some people even call a remission state. So their moods change depending if they are in an acute relapsed psychotic state or they are in a remiss state. The moods change may be incomprehensible. So that's a very important point about schizophrenia, which means that a person may have a mood state which we cannot relate to in a way that is comprehensible to us. For example, a person may tell uh, the, the clinician about someone important to them, a loved one in the family that died, and then they start giggling and laughing. And of course, for us to comprehend that, we expect the person to have a sad state or at least a sad face at the moment where they're talking about someone who is a loved person in their family or friend who passed away, at least to see sadness, what we see is giggling inappropriately. So that's what I mean by the incomprehensibility of the mood state. And that is 
quite common in patients with schizophrenia. Mood generally improves, especially the stability of it with antipsychotic medications. So the bottom line, as you see there, is that the mood changes are frequently a manifestation of the schizophrenia itself, the underlying disease. Next slide, please. Anxiety disorders, that's a whole group. You see the list, panic disorder, agoraphobia, specific phobias, generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorder due to medical conditions. What we can say generally about that is that the mood is related to the severity of the diagnosis and symptoms. And mood improves by treating the specific underlying condition. So here's an example. Let's say um, I have a patient with obsessive compulsive disorder. And I've been treating this patient for a while with a combination of psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy. They understand their obsessions. And when they have recurrent obsessions, their anxiety goes up. And one of the ways they relieve their anxiety is by acting in a compulsive way. So that before they perform a specific compulsion that helps them to relieve the anxiety associated with the obsession. Example, uh, I've treated a person who uh, suffers from obsessive compulsive disorder. And when she drives to work in the morning, she hits a bump in the road and she is now worried that maybe she hit a little child that was there. And then she is worrying, what if that child was hit? Now, you know, how can I leave that child? I gotta go, you know, and help them and so on. But the other thought is, no, it was just a bump in the road. Well, how do you know it was a bump in the road? Maybe it was a child. Well, you're not sure. So the anxiety goes up and up and up and the obsess obsession keeps coming back. So what do they do? They, that person turns back on the road and starts driving again to look to see if they hit that child, what happened to that child, where is that child and so on. And of course they hit the bump in the road, they stop the car, they go out and they check to reassure themselves. So the compulsion is to go back and recheck in slow driving to make sure they didn't hit, they did not hit a small child. So that person comes in for a session telling me that. And I say, and how, I say how, how do you feel today? And I look at their face and say, you look sad. And they say, yes, not only am I sad, Dr. Torm, I feel horrible, I feel depressed. I am disappointed in myself, and I am also feeling that I have disappointed you. And I ask, what happened? And then they tell me this story. So the story is the fact that they acted on their compulsion to go back and check rather than try and control the obsession by using cognitive behavioral methods on their own, which they have learned, and they acted on the compulsion. To them, it feels like a disappointment to themselves. And of course, now they feel they have disappointed me and how is it affecting their mood? They feel sad and depressed. So that's an example of a mood swing within one diagnosis of the anxiety disorders group that could produce a mood swing. But of course, in the psychotherapy session with that person, we're able to change that and the mood of sadness disappeared and was replaced by a more normal uh, 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 hopeful, optimistic mood. Post-traumatic stress disorder, of course, the mood changes are affected by the, the uh, intrusive traumatic memories that that person is suffering from at the time. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, now we're talking about non-bipolar depressions. So there's of course major depressive disorder, dysthymic disorder, depressive disorder due to medical conditions and depressive disorder not otherwise specified. So here generally favorable response to psychotherapy, medications or both. And the important thing is I'll just pick one of uh, diagnosis of this group like dysthymic disorder. Typically we know people who suffer from that have had a loss, a significant loss uh, in their teenage years or, or, or before. And they are very, very sensitive to losses later on in life or even impending losses where they perceive a loss is about to take place that 
triggers them into a state of sadness, anxiety, and of course, a depressed state. So it again relates to the underlying dynamics behind it. And people like that respond to psychotherapy and medications, mostly a combination of both. Next slide, please. All right, this group, dissociative disorders. You see from the list here, the underlying, of course, mechanism is dissociation. And uh, I don't think we had this topic covered in the past. Sarah, you probably know all the topics that were covered in the past. I don't remember that being covered, but maybe it was. But if it wasn't, I'll be happy to do one presentation devoted fully to dissociative disorders. And, but that's a whole other story. The underlying dynamic, of course, is dissociation. And many episodes of dissociation occur in such a way that the person develops amnesia, either, either complete amnesia or partial amnesia to the episode. A good example for that is, of course, dissociative amnesia and dissociative fugue. A dissociative fugue state is somebody that travels in their car, sometimes even on the expressway, and gets to another place, and they don't know how they got there and what exactly they're doing there. Sometimes they get involved in a whole new set of activities and life events, and then they have no memory when they get back to the original location. They don't remember what they were doing there and how they even got there. A good example is a patient in her late 30s, married, mother of three children, works as a secretary in a medical office, leaves the office to go home around five o'clock. And instead of arriving home where she was expecting to get to eat dinner with her family, she ends up on the expressway driving on I-71 to Columbus, and when she sees the sign 10 miles to Columbus, she goes like this, oh, oh my God, what am I doing here? I'm supposed to be home. She has no memory of her whole travel on the expressway towards Columbus, doesn't remember the ride, the, the driving, and is in a state of panic, of course, how she got there and what is she doing there? Was she supposed to be home instead? That's an example of dissociative fugue. Dissociative identity disorder, we don't have enough time to get into it. It's too complicated, but again, the underlying issue is dissociation. And the person who has that can switch a dissociative switch from one identity state to another, many times accompanied by amnesia. So they are in one identity state that is depressed and they switch to another one, even within the same session that is not depressed and is rather high and optimistic. And you look at them and say, what just happened? And they look at you like, they don't know what you're talking about. Like they just got into the session this moment when they switched. Depersonalization disorder and dissociative disorder NOS. So all, all of these, the underlying dynamic is the dissociative mechanism. Next slide, please. All right, personality disorders. Well, you look at the list here. And what I wanna say is talk about two conditions mostly, or maybe three. One is borderline personality disorder. Mood swings are very common part of this diagnosis. There are some writings and research uh, that has been done where people say that borderline personality disorder is really a misnomer and it belongs into what's called the bipolar spectrum disorder or bipolar NOS. In that is that that's not been fully worked out because as you know, DSM-5 does not accept that, but there is a prediction that in the future, we may see this diagnosis move into the bipolar spectrum disorder. Uh, histrionic personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorders. These conditions are very, very sensitive to what happens around them socially especially in relationship to friends uh, or colleagues, whether it's at work or whether it's in the family, uh, they get into a depressed, irritable, sometimes crying state when they feel they've been either ignored or they, have, they feel they have not been treated respectfully enough. 
So the bottom line with personality disorders, mood swings, is that these are life, it's a lifelong pattern and a manifestation of the behavioral dynamics in specific uh, relationships and specific conditions that they have. Uh, dependent personality disorder uh, would be someone, let's say, that is dependent on a spouse, whether it's a wife or a husband or a husband or a wife or a wide variety of activities. And when that person either gets sick or passes away, guess what happens to the one that's born, was dependent on many times, they become not just anxious, but anxious and very sad and depressed to the point of being dysfunctional. Next slide, please. Okay, here is a whole group of miscellaneous conditions, eating disorders, sleep disorders, impulse control disorders, adjustment disorders, medication-induced disorders, relational problems, and grief, mourning, anniversary reactions. So bottom line with all the mood swings are very common in these conditions are a manifestation of the behavioral dynamics of the specific condition that the person has. Next slide, please. All right, underlying medical conditions. Look at the list, and this is just a limited list. Hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, Cushing's disease, Addison's disease, uh, PMS, premenstrual, of course, syndrome, and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, birth control, hormones, pregnancy, menopause, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, carcinoid syndrome. So all these are medical conditions that are associated with different hormones, either sudden increase or sudden withdrawal from them that uh, could manifest itself with mood swings. Depression is common, irritability, anxiety, uh, and so on, especially with uh, Cushing's the disease, as you know, is too, too many corticosteroid hormones. With Addison's disease, it's the other way around. Okay, next, please. Next slide. Um, mood swings due to prescribed medications. So corticosteroids, like an example, prednisone, uh, that some people take due to a variety of conditions, whether it's allergies or autoimmune disorders, could produce depression, a paranoid states, and of course, high irritability as well. Some people even states of what's called like a, a mild hypomanic states. Chemotherapy uh, for the control of cancer, drugs for autoimmune disorders, uh, some beta blockers, some calcium channel blockers, all these are examples of medications that are prescribed but usually by uh, primary care physicians, sometimes uh, experts in endocrinology or uh, in oncology, and they are typically associated with mood swings. Most commonly is anxiety and depression. Okay, next slide, please. All right, I produced this slide specifically to show you a summary comparing the bipolar mood swings to the non-bipolar mood swings. And we have talked I've talked mostly, mentioned most of these things already, but I just put it together in one slide that allows every one of us to be able to see the differences. Okay, there is one thing on the right-hand side where it says mood responsive to therapy and SC, which is social changes. This is what it stands for. Simply didn't have enough boom in the slide to put it in. Okay, so SC is social changes in the dynamics of social relationships. All right, next slide, please. Okay, these are references. Lots of them are, uh, I would say, very helpful. I specifically will uh, point out to one author. Her name is Kay Redfield Jameson. She is a psychologist and professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry there. And she is the author of several books. Uh, her first book is An Unquiet Mind, which describes her own condition. And of course, she has been suffering from bipolar mood disorder all her life. 
but she describes how long it took her to be diagnosed and how she resisted the treatment with lithium, which is a mood stabilizer, and how her life has changed for the better after she started taking lithium carbonate. So what I'm telling you is all described in her book, An Unquiet Mind. And she also describes in another book called Touched by Fire, very many famous people that have suffered from bipolar disorder, including composers, politicians, authors, uh, artists, and so on. Very fascinating book in many ways. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, here I've included several uh, articles and sources to read about the idea that bipolar disorder exists on a spectrum. And there are many other bipolar, now, as you know, DSM-4 and 5 uh, uh, accept the diagnosis of bipolar type 1 and bipolar type 2, and then they have bipolar NOS, not otherwise specified. But uh, there are quite a few researchers that have advocate bipolar 3, bipolar 4. So one of them is Hago Bakiskel. Uh, he wrote an excellent article titled The Evolving Bipolar Spectrum as you see there. And there have been others that have been writing about the bipolar spectrum, as you see articles from 2001 by Hirschfeld and Engst, uh, the bipolar spectrum. So just some additional things to read about when it deals with the whole issue of bipolar spectrum. I think this is it in terms of my slides.